The price has risen to about 30 pounds. So it stayed the same. So what you find out about swords is when you buy them and they seldom ever go up. Or <laughs> they don't lose a lot and they don't gain much. They might go up a couple of dollars, but they cost more to buy new when you get them built than they do to buy the original oftentimes. Unless you're getting uh, a collector piece with that's engraved and, and it's dedicated to somebody. Those ceremonial things are dedicated swords, um, presentational stuff. But w the stuff that we use, if you buy it because of the blade, because mostly because of the blade, and less because of the rest of it, usually um, we're paying more because mm. yet the, there's there's something like four or five epee blade or sport fencing blade places left on the planet. That's right. it. Right, right. They're all going. They're yeah, all I had a great, I, I was buying these certain blades. Uh, I want to say they're actually from China. They, they weren't probably good for competition fencing. I think they would have died under that weight of effort, but they were fine for us, right? And every time I'd go back to acquire more for my students or for myself, a company inevitably would go out of business and, and I would have to start from scratch, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. There's a, a company in, uh, in the States, blue, blue something. Blue I'd have to, I could find it for you. Yeah. But, it's, uh, but they, blue gauntlet. they, what? Blue gauntlet. That might be it. Yeah. I think that's what they're called. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they have a good Epe blade at about 23 to 25 bucks American. So by the time we get it, we're paying about forty-five to forty-eight dollars. By the time you pay the the difference in the dollar and the uh, shipping and the the duties, but it's still better than a lot, and it's affordable, and they last, they stand up. Mm. So there, what you have to be careful of is that you don't order an electric blade because that that has a weakness at the tang and the right. shoulders because of the groove. And you need one with a full tang on it. So you want, you don't want the short little tang that, that you fit on sport weapons. Yeah, you want the, the full long tang. So it's usually referred to as a practice blade. And they're usually really cheap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But these ones are, the ones that they carry are pretty well made. And there's one that's coated and one that's not coated. The coated one resists rust. So for people in um, wet, wetter climates. Humid, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For us out here, we just get the dry. When you, because let's talk about fencing for a sec. When you're experiencing fencing, because I don't think a lot of people realize uh, the, the number of blades breaking in competition. Because I remember uh, a fencing club uh, gave Chris like a bucket of, of basically broken apes and foil, uh, sabers, I think. And they're all broken during a competition. So it was like a, this around. And so talk to us a bit about uh, your experience with blades in, in fencing, what you've, what you've seen and, and how often they've broken on you compared to let's say stage combat. Well, I've been teaching at the university here for close to 50 years. I've been 45, 46 years here. And over that time, I've probably seen less than 10 blades broken. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's great. Because of handling. Mm -hmm. It's how you handle them. And it's how you teach people how to handle them. Right. When they break in competition, they're more aggressive. And so when, when they, that pressure, when it happens soft, it doesn't do much. When it's fast and sudden, which is what it is, and a little close, and because they do get a bit close in competition, when they're running at each other, yeah. and they'll bend a blade, and it'll that that'll snap it. When the blade breaks, not everybody knows this. When the blade breaks, both sides of the break have one edge on it all the time. That's like a little razor blade. 
So in a fencing competition in the 50s to 60s, I'm pretty sure it's the 50s, an Italian and a Russian were meeting in an international competition and the blade snapped. And, and I think it was the Russian and uh, it went through the, the Italian's mask into his eye and into his head. It was that sharp and that much pressure. And the masks are so, you know, they're, they're very resistant to, I'm sure. to that kind of thing. Yeah. Anyway, it killed the guy. And the other guy quit fencing for the rest of his life. Never taught, never did, wouldn't pick it up ever. Right. But that's the danger. And people need to know that it's steel is steel, you know, yeah. no matter what it is. Even aluminum, dull, you can have a dull blade. It's still metal. Absolutely. And, you know, somebody used to say metal against bone, the bone always loses out, you know. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I just, so, and I just want to point out, just in case anyone missed it, so when you were talking about only seeing 10 breaks, that was during the stage, those were stage combat classes, not during fencing uh, training. Both. Both, okay. Because you're not uh, having them at a competition level speed where you see the effort on the blade, where, where you said people are too close and moving too quickly. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. Just in case. There was, the, there was a, a production of Zestrazzi in Toronto years ago uh, long after the the first one uh, mm. that Patty did, and I happened to be in Toronto briefly for that, and they had broken in two days, I think, three or five blades. Wow! And they were breaking at the hilt, and they were one or two of them actually flew into the audience, and I can't remember who was fight director on that, but I don't think it was one of us. In fact, I know it wasn't. <laughs> I do know who it was, but anyway, okay. it was it was somebody in Toronto. And they were they were in, in the early parts of their career and didn't I don't think knew anything about uh, that part of uh, state you know, if you're gonna do fights, you need to know about the weaponry. For if sure. you tighten that bit between the, the tang and the shoulders of the blade too much, you you split the metal molecules. And so by tightening that pommel, and a lot of actors do it, they tighten that pommel, tighten that pommel, and finally they're fighting and the blade just falls off. I'm happy you said that because I, I wanted you to talk about that because um, the two places we always see them where they do break uh, uh, is right by the foible. Yeah. And, and, and right at the shoulders, you know? And, and it's interesting that, uh, I'm happy you said that because, because I've had people ask me um, when something's broken, why? And, and uh, provided it isn't like flex, flex, flex at the foible, it was totally that they screwed the, uh, the blade apart. Yeah, it's, yeah. you cannot put that much pressure on it. Yeah. And that goes with, with all those blades. And a uh, broadsword will do it, but it'll do it at the top of the tang because the broadsword near the shoulders is a, a more triangular shape usually. Right. And uh, so because of that, it has more strength near the blade, but further away, it gets to that part that, that you put the screw on and that part will break. Right. Still, because of the pressure. And the pressure is inside the blade the handle, the grip, needs to be snug on the blade because if it if it's loose inside, it allows movement like this inside, and as that happens, um, eventually it'll wear it down, and the same thing will happen. So you can break the top as well. So you need to be, as as a fight director or somebody who's working on fights or props person, you need to be aware of those things so that you can help fix them or adjust for them before they happen. Right. And make sure they don't happen. Right, right. Yeah. And, and actually something you just said that I think is worth commenting on. The, the poor gentleman who, who, in the act of sport fencing, took a life and no longer wanted to fence anymore. This is not in any way a strike against fencing as not being, because I've heard people say, oh, that's not real. That's not what I'm talking about at all. 
But I would, su su I would suggest that when we're creating the illusion of violence between characters, when characters think, or there's an expectation one of them's gonna die, versus uh, let's say in Hamlet, where Hamlet thinks they're there to have a friendly sporting event, yeah. you approach it differently. And, and I, think, I think it'd be really valuable if you talked about that. The, how do you approach the difference between a character who thinks they aren't going into a life and death situation versus one, like for instance, in the Scottish play or in Romeo and Juliet, uh, when Laertes, uh, um, uh, when, um, uh, yeah, so when, 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 when Romeo actually takes a life, right? with Paris. There's a huge difference between the sporting of Hamlet, right? Oh, yeah. Well, Hamlet, in Hamlet, um, I, uh, just recently, uh, Brent Carver, who did Hamlet in my years at Stratford, I was only there for three years, um, but I ended up doing 17 shows with fights in them in three years, and I had no assistance. I was the guy. So I did that and some acting. And I was paid for my acting and, and then sort of given a, 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 a little a stipend. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like an honorarium, excuse me, or a gift. Uh, yeah. Like that. You know that, that gag about, uh, I'm sorry, just, it, it's just that joke uh, um, from uh, Woody Allen in Hello, uh, what's got, I think it's that. Anyway, and, and the person says he's working at, at, a, uh, at a, uh, a strip club and it's for 50 pounds a week or something. The person says, that's not very much. It's all I can afford. You know, that joke about we have to pay people to let us do our art, right? <laughs> well, it was close. So anyway, during that time, Brent was uh, doing the Hamlet. Brent just passed away yeah. last month. Yeah. Brent and uh, in my time at Stratford, Brent and Colin Fiore were the, for my money, were the two strongest sword fighters. And because they were both amazing actors and really exceptional moving people. So, and they were both, the other interesting thing is, again, for, for, from my point of view at the time, um, both those men were uh, the most generous to the younger actors of all the company that was there. And I've never forgotten that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway. Brandt, when he was playing Hamlet, played his part in the fight as if he was doing a friendly, he was aggressive, but he was doing a friendly bout, completely innocent of the side that Laertes had taken, played by Scott Wentworth, who was also really, really good. Scott's a, another amazing guy. Um, so they were, you know, the intent was really clear and it was really well set up. So the presentation of Scott's character was a little more intense. And especially the intensity would build as, you know, when Hamlet gets the first hit and, he, and then he gets another one. And, just, yeah. and he says, I, I'll get him now to the king. And the king says, uh, I do not think it. Yeah. Exactly. Saying, Not. Yeah. I, I don't think you get hit the broadside of a barnyard the way you're going. <laughs> anyway, so they, they continue and then finally it's revealed. We find out from not from anything in the dialogue, but in the action that Laertes uh, blade, we know it as the audience, but Hamlet finds it out that his blade has no ball at the end. Right. There's no protection. And we actually had Epe blades, and we had one with a little black tip on it, and the other one without, which is kind of the way we do stage fighting. Anyway, we don't we don't work with little black uh, balls on the end to protect the actor. They learn how to fight. They learn how to use a stage weapon. So that was already there, <laughs> but the actors were superb. So the acting is what really carried it. The fight remained a fight and the aggression came out of hamlet wanting to win which he played really no no trouble playing that you know but the other one the frustration came through 
not being able to hit him, but needing to hit him and needing to hit him with that little poison point. Wow. So amazing. I, I have to say, I'm not surprised at all with what you said about Brent because uh, I was very fortunate to work with him when I was at Stratford and, and I of course seen him in numerous things and uh, he really was special and, and uh, did remarkable things. And, and something you said earlier when you're watching Todd rehearse the fights, when I watched Brent in rehearsal, which of course the audience will never see, right? Yeah. Uh, I was always amazed at the fantastic discoveries, the wonderful work that would never be shared in rehearsal. And, and there's something really uniquely about, about what he was doing and, and, uh, and, and Colm for that matter. Uh, just, just you really felt very lucky to have been in the room to see it. Oh yeah. You know, and, and I think that's, that might be one of the major, um, one of the major uh, treats and gifts that we get to experience all that, even, even stuff, you know, when you watch something and, and it's not the right choice for the show or, or uh, it's a one-off, but still you're quite, you're quite, uh, you're quite taken by what you saw. And as you said, also, it's a great idea. We're just not going to use it this time. Steal it for another time. Oh yeah. You know, because there has been a number of, of things where I have to admit, uh, I thought this was great. You file it away because another opportunity will present itself and it'll be perfect where it wasn't appropriate previously. So I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to uh, remember these magical moments. Oh yeah. When, when, uh, you know, similarly, when we saw him at one point, he was doing a scene in uh, just as one of his soliloquies in Hamlet and there was 40 something people sitting around the room and it was in the Avon rehearsal room. And there was, you know, we were all sitting there. It was the end of the day. And Brent started to do one of these soliloquies. And every, and this right at the beginning of rehearsal. And it was bizarre. It was strange, you know. And he was trying things. Sure. And the one, you know, he was shy. But in a rehearsal hall, all the shyness disappeared. And he would try anything and he didn't care what you thought. And everybody in the room, myself included, we're looking at each other saying, what is, what is this? <laughs> this is so bizarre, you know. But you were watching, uh, right? I, you were absolutely probably captivated. Well, we were watching, but we were mystified as to what is this ever <laughs> going to come to? Yeah. And finally, three weeks later, he's brilliant and yeah. we're all about the same. Mm -hmm. So he moves way ahead and we're still floating along where we started three weeks ago. So when you got to work with him, so I, I was lucky because I got to do uh, Romeo and Juliet, um, his Twelfth Night, his Hamlet, his Macbeth, his Richard III, and his Cyrano, um, and Rosencrantz and Gildens Turner Dead. I got to do all those with him. So that was, you know, for me, that was a big, that was young guy from Saskatchewan, you know, loving the chances I got to do that kind of work. And that was because of John Neville and eventually Robin Phillips. So that was, I was you know, I was a lucky camper. <laughs> For sure. I don't, I don't know if you uh, met Dean Gabry, uh, but uh, he's a director. Dean, Dean's a director. And he said something I, I've always kept to heart about, you know, you've done your job well as an actor by the time you've closed a show, you have no regrets that you should have tried something. Like all through rehearsal, you tried all the different choices, you experienced all the different things. And so when you close the show, you don't go, ah, I should have, uh, you know? And, and I thought that's really useful because um, sometimes I'll be directing and an actor will like something they did and it might be really good, but we, you have nothing to compare it to until they try something else as well. So you may go back to the original idea, but I, I like them to try different things just to make sure it is in fact the best choice. And as you, as you said, uh, when you said that you were the same at the, at the end of that rehearsal process, uh, we do sometimes as artists get into a, we plateau or we get into a, a rut and there's something about in rehearsal as opposed to messing over your acting partners in, in performance. But uh, 
But I, 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 I actually really, really uh, was amazed at his, um, uh, at Brent's trying these different things. Because I totally understand what you're talking about, about the things being odd. But I, I really was captivated, right? Oh, he would try anything. Yeah. And, and eventually, they would turn into these amazing things that you would go, wow. You know, that was, it was well worth the wait and, and all those things that he went through to get to it. And he had the, the boldness um, to do it because you have to be courageous and bold to do that. You can't just, because most of us think, what will people think? Well, he didn't, yeah. once he walked into the rehearsal hall, he didn't care what people thought. He just went in to do those things and he would be amazing so sure. i think it's it's well worth uh you know that that energy I, there was something else i was gonna but i can't remember anyway it'll well, come back maybe but if you don't mind i might prompt you to remember because what you're basically saying is things you wish people knew right being being actors or fight uh, uh performers so if you had someone, you and you could just say, these are really things I, I would like people to know. Do you have a list that you want to share, right? And one of them, you just said, be brave. Yeah. You know, well, don't, care, don't care what people think. Give it a try, right? Yeah. When, when you're doing um, fights in a, a show, when we did uh, Taming of the Shrew at Stratford, we, we ran it from the end of May or the beginning of June until the beginning of November, wow. round about the second or third week in October, we all came off stage. And I just had a couple of small parts in that, but Calm Fior and the Goldie Semple were playing the leads. But we all came, the entire company, including the kids, came off the stage saying, that was it. We hit it. Tonight, we hit it. So we did all those months of, those weeks and months of that run up till almost where it closed. And we finally hit it where everybody thought that was it. That was the best one from top to bottom that we did through the run. When you're doing a fight in a show, we, there's, we always have glitches. We have, you know, things there. And the audience has no idea what they see they think is supposed to happen unless it's really, you know, unless blades fall apart and the actor falls apart and somebody gets Kristen calls the wheels come right off. Right. But, yeah. But when you're working yeah. on it, if you, you think I'm, I'm going to make this better and better and better until we hit the end of the run. And every time we do it, I'm going to try to improve on what I did the last time or the last few times. If you go with, with that, even if you don't quite succeed, at least if you go with that attitude, and the same with your, your performance, the more in the moment you are, or that you allow yourself to be, the more rich the performance is. And one of the things, again, about Brent and Colm, when you're working with them, when you're on stage with them, they are in the moment, and it's easier than for you to go back with the same. And if you, one night I wasn't quite there with Brent and he, he gave me a little shit off stage for said, you know, I'm, I'm out there for three hours. If you can't come out for three minutes and hold it, don't bother coming. And I thought, wow. Boy, wow. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so I told him about that. Oh, last time he was here in Edmonton and he didn't remember, but he was, he was devastated that he actually said something like that. <laughs> but I said it was a great lesson for me to be reminded that every time you go on, if you really treasure this work that we get to do, you'll go on every time yeah. and give it everything you've got. Yeah. And not just for you, but for the person or persons that you're working with and eventually ultimately for the audience who comes there to receive it, you know. So it's yeah, we're in a so when we get back to after COVID and we're allowed to do that again, 
But in the meantime, if we if we take those little pockets uh, of time to work with two or three people at a time, we can still, there's a lot of things like that that we can do and catch up and hone something though. So one of the things I want to do over the next while is get a little more broadsword under my belt, you know, nice. because what I did as broadsword compared to what they're doing today is vast two worlds apart, you know, understood but i, I want stuff they do today oh, yeah. i, I want to share something that uh our friend ian rose uh put into a really compact uh uh thought which was forgive yourself immediately oh yeah and i just love that because in nowhere does ian mean uh don't give a shit or yeah. or don't put in the effort not at all ian means exactly what you just said we're inevitably going to make a mistake because we're human but forgive yourself immediately so you can get on and progress and, and continue. And, and stay in to, it. Yeah, and I just want to reinforce what you just said with that statement and also to give a shout out to Ian because he's amazing. But uh, I thought you'd appreciate that. Forgive yourself immediately. Like I, and, I, and, he, and I'm sure if Ian was here, he'd be the first to say, oh, I didn't invent that. But he, he put it into the vernacular for us and really, and I've used it and I've run with it ever since hearing it. Well, I, we, we had that. We did a uh, show Breaking Legs here. And the director knew that we were going to mess up on opening night constantly because we had never had a run where we hadn't had a handful, a good handful or a couple of handfuls of glitches in the performing of it. And he said, when you hit, not if you hit, but when you hit a glitch, forgive yourself immediately. And I thought that was 25 years into my career. And I thought, God, I wish I had heard that when I was 15, you know. <laughs> totally. Oh, my God. I guess, and actually, I'm going to ask, I'm going to share another one. And, and uh, this one comes from Kirsten. She claims this is not what she said, but I'm going to still give her the credit. And it's, it's rigorous compassion. But I'm going to say we're better at giving it to others, compassion to others, rigorous compassion for yourself, right? Because there's so many actors I know who beat the hell out of themselves uh, and this goes beyond forgive yourself. I mean, they literally are frozen for fear of making a mistake. And, and you know that, that idea that this is where they're going to find me out and I'm a hack, right? And totally un, unworthy of love or respect, right? And that, that compassion has come up again. This rigorous compassion has come up again in, in uh, other things I've been studying um, with Chris and I are looking into with diversity and, and leadership in, in today's uh, in today's days and times. But I wanted to share that too with you because uh, you're compassionate, but you have a rigor to it. You demand, I've been in your room and you expect students to really, really commit and work. But I, I'm i pleased I've never seen you do what some teachers in my past would have said, like that was stupid. Or um, you're not trying, you're not thinking. You know what I mean? Like things that, let's call them well, it doesn't help any of us. When, right? Yeah. When we, hear, when we hear it personally, when somebody tells us that, it doesn't improve our performance no. or our work habit. We just feel bad. But if somebody says, you know, if you could, if you did this instead of doing what you're doing, you could do that. But instead of doing that, if you if you take this tact, um, it'll help you get to what you're trying to do and you're supporting them and you're also helping each other move ahead you know the other thing i tell my students uh, a lot is or uh, from time to time um when you're there if if you're not you know if you're having a bad day you have no energy they still have to work with you it's unfair for you to pull back from their their development and what they're getting it's if you don't have the generosity to give to them that says um you know i'm i'm a bit out of it but i'm going to do everything i can to make it at least make it better for you then the focus goes to the other person and you're putting something into it and ultimately that's what we we need to do anyway so it changes our the scope of what where we're going. I had a student 
um, who was, she, she hated it. She hated stage fighting, fencing the whole shebang. And I said, that's fine. But I said, your partner is stuck with you. And I said, it's unfair for you to do that to your partner. So at least have the decency to go and do whatever you can for your partner. Well, three weeks later, she was, she started liking it. And she was as good as her partner and helped her partner improve. And she got it. And then she be also became a better actor because she incorporated that into her acting. So it wasn't just her, it wasn't looking at herself. It was what I can do to better the work that my partners are doing with me. You know? Brilliant. Yeah. That's I, uh, I, I promised I wasn't going to keep you forever. So this is just an excuse for me to do this with you again later. Because I, I'm going to say this has been a phenomenal conversation. And, and I'm just looking at the time. And you probably should get out because I'm looking at nice weather for the first time in a week. Uh, so let's do this again soon. And, um, and I'm probably going to break this up into three parts because you've just been such a wealth of, of, uh, information and you've just had so much to share. I'll keep notes next time. <laughs> <laughs> but if I may, I just want to say thank you so much, not just for this, but everything you've done for everyone you have, um, come in contact with. I uh, I have to say that you are a living treasure and you are greatly loved. Thank you. It's very kind. <laughs> and we'll talk again soon. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, thanks, Daniel. <laughs>